So now here on stage, you see a Dutch guy explaining you how to make money. So true Dutch fashion, <laughs> it is exactly what we're known about. I see some people coming in. I'm very happy that you're joining me here today. I know you could have been doing other things, like uh, printing a t-shirt with GoDaddy or expanding your collection of socks, for example. I know I have. Um, so yeah, my name is Roger. I am indeed the C CEO of WPCS. And today we're going to be talking about MRR for WordPress agencies. So I'm going to step outside of the light for just a second. And by show of hands, who are the agency owners in the room, please? All right, that's great. Thanks. Thanks for being so honest. Uh, you can stay. Uh, for the rest of the people, I think it's pretty clear. Um, you can go. It's, it's fine now. I'm trying to be, you know, create a moment here with my peers. Obviously, not all of you are agency owners, uh, but I think most of us are trying to predict our revenue. Um, I was just having a meeting with a very interesting other agency owner from Portugal, and to be quite honest with you, the reason I wanted to do it is because I wanted to be a digital nomad. I just wanted to know how much money I would have in the next six months so that I could go to Thailand or Bali and enjoy my life building websites. And so I want to start this slide by addressing the elephant in the room. I'm obviously not talking about Vikas, by the way. Um, he is not an elephant. Uh, he is wise like an elephant and he eats predominantly leaves. But I'm obviously talking about Shopify. So Shopify, I notice, is something that we are not allowed to mention. Um, you know? <laughs> and obviously I'm not here to promote Shopify or sell you WordPress. But I do think that there's a lot to learn from Shopify. And we can only do better than Shopify if we can first learn what they do really well. And so, as far as I'm concerned and the way I look at it, Shopify is what I see as the ultimate website as a service. They give you a website and they pretty much sell you the whole solution. And they provide value up front, which I think is very valuable and something that is sometimes missing in WordPress. It takes a... It takes a while, even if you are an experienced WordPress developer, to put something in the site and then show it to your customer, and then they are like, wow, this is awesome. And I think the WordPress community can actually do better by adopting a product-based mindset. So like I said, you deliver value up front, you wow them, and then you go from there. And the way that I've personally experienced how you can do that is by creating a website as a service. So website as a service is quite simple. I know sometimes it's a little bit confusing as per the definition, but it really is you give people the total solution in an often standardized but very niche specific way in a way that they can onboard themselves and then you scale that up. And that is something that I've experienced personally as being the best recurring revenue model for agencies. But that didn't go easy or as planned, really. Um, so to give you a bit of context uh, as to where I come from, um, this is what Amsterdam looks like during the pandemic. And we had been an agency for quite some time. We transitioned from a marketing agency to also include selling websites. And at the same time, we were building a startup <laughs> for hotels. <laughs> and also, our agency was serving mostly gyms and restaurants. Yeah. And on the 23rd of March, we were supposed to launch our app, which is my birthday. And on the March 17, the whole country went into lockdown. So within the course of a week, our entire business, the app that we were supposed to launch, and the agency that we were successfully running uh, collapsed. And you can imagine that to be a shock. We weren't even panicked because we were just basically way too shocked. So we had to let go staff. We had to leave behind the app. Uh, somebody asked us today if we did something else with it. We did. We transitioned the app to help people uh, get things nearby, and it really didn't work. Um, but at least we tried. What we noticed looking back is that we were mostly serving or building projects, right? And I love projects. I love the fact that you can really focus on a project for a customer, look at it from all angles, and then just absorb all the work, right? And then build the hours. But now we had a much smaller team, and morale was 
pretty low, and we had to find a way to pivot out of a crisis. And trying to find a way to do so, some guy trying to give good advice said, it sounds like you're giving away free nachos to sell more drinks. And it was a bit of a weird statement, but he said it in the context of, you're often selling websites for a very low price so that you can then upsell services on the back end. And that is exactly what we were doing. We were very often just giving away websites for free and then upselling marketing services, content and whatnot on the back end. So now we were back at square one. We needed to find a new way to scale up our agency. Obviously, I still wanted to go to Bali or Thailand, even though it was completely forbidden at the time. And we started looking at MRR generating revenue models. And I'm sure you recognize most of them. So let's talk about the first one, right? Development retainer model. Great model if you're a big agency already. If you have the staff on hand that can immediately service the customer and then build those hours going months forward, build some uh, pipeline, you know, that's great. If you can also target larger agencies, I love that. I actually see somebody in the room right here is doing that, Jimmy. Yeah, that's a great, it's a, it's a great model. Uh, didn't really work for us with a small team, but it was, it, was, it was pretty good when we were doing it at the time. Maintenance is something that I cut my teeth in and also cut myself with. Um, it's really fun if you're selling people plugin updates and then something ho goes horribly wrong. Uh, I think we've all seen this year a fair amount of vulnerabilities with plugins and then you have to spend significant time fixing those. So the small retainer model that you, that you charge on a monthly basis really doesn't cover all the extra effort that you then suddenly have to put in, let alone the, the weekends spent because you auto set your plugin updates on Friday, uh, which is always a lot of fun. I love it when hosting companies say, you can automate your updates with us and just set it on Friday and then you can spend your entire Saturday afternoon not with your friends. Reporting, one of the less scalable models uh, that we thought was a really great idea at the time. Uh, Seaburn, who's my co-founder in the back here, he loves creating dashboards, and um, he built a really, really great dashboard. Uh, metrics are his thing. Not so much for our customers, though. They often couldn't really understand what the metrics meant. And so you spend most of your time explaining a standardized dashboard, you know, that perfectly and beautifully draws in all their metrics into uh, reporting, um, and then you have to explain what conversions mean or what top of funnel and bottom of funnel really is. Uh, time spent on site, how that actually leads to more conversions. And you actually only can really skill that model if you have a sophisticated customer, it seems to me. And then my, my favorite, um, for sure the least uh, scalable model at the time, obviously we now are all using AI to generate content, even though we are hesitant to admit it. Um, but yeah, I'm a content maker by trade. I wanted to standardize the content. I thought it was a good idea to just charge a monthly fee and then generate blogs and photos and videos. And then you have scope creep because they want another video or they want more photos or they want different angles or they want a blog updated every month. It's, it all works, right? It all kind of works. Uh, and you can charge a few thousand here and a few hundred there. But at the end of the day, it's really hard to predict whether or not they're going to stay because you spend most of your time on the phone discussing or arguing with angry customers about what the reporting means or whether or not the hours in your development retainer really are amounting up to what you promised. So we needed to shift. We needed to shift that project-based focus to a product-based model. And on the photo right here, you see another one of my co-founders in the crowd, Weinand, and I'm challenging you to pronounce that name if you're not Dutch. And he calls me up about two weeks into the pandemic. And he says to me, we're probably going to be selling more websites, right? And I say, yeah, I'm pretty much pretty sure we, we have to because, you know, we're all stuck at home. And he says, yeah, I think I'm going to build a platform that will allow me to spin up sites automatically and then let customers or users rather onboard themselves and then we can charge a monthly recurring fee. And then as they qualify themselves because they need more stuff, we can upsell more marketing services. And I was like, that sounds really cool, but it's never been built before. And he says, no, I have no idea. I'm just going to build it. 
And so the moment I slam down the phone, I pick up the phone again and I call a friend of mine who has another agency and I say, hey look, um, I, my other co-founder has just uh, pitched me an idea for this platform, I have really no idea what it means, uh, but we can standardize sites and it sounds like that's what you're doing as well in a very unscalable way, you wanna partake. And um, before we knew it, we were supposed to launch a tool for ourselves and it turned into a cloud platform pretty fast. So, Over the past two years, I've spoken to hundreds of agencies. First, because we didn't have self-activating, um, uh, you couldn't activate your subscription yourself, so you had to literally go through me. And after, because we were interested in the agencies actually building a website as a service. And what I know from experience and from the conversations that I've had here is that of the few agency owners that are actually in this crowd, pretty much all of them have considered the website as a service model at some point if only we could make it work. So again, the WAS model is the complete opposite of what most agencies are doing these days. And I wanna take an analogy that I borrowed from a friend, uh, Vito from Atarim, who is solving a similar problem in a different way. They're standardizing the collaboration and communication with the customer, and we are standardizing the building of the product and scalability itself. But he likened agencies with Michelin star restaurants, right? Uh, I'm guilty of that. I tried to turn every project into a multi-course meal. And a multi-course meal is great because it, you know, is more, more expensive. But it's also very unscalable. I don't know if Michelin star restaurants are your thing, but they are pretty much always empty. And that's not because they aren't popular, it's because they have very few tables. And that's really what it is, right? You have to spend so much time on the actual product itself, and there's so much scope creep, and your customers get so much more demanding because they're paying for it, that it's a very unscalable way of doing it, and most restaurant owners burn out. I personally regret never being able to eat at Noma. Uh, I would love to. On the opposite side of that, you have the product-based agency. And I honestly just spoke with an agency owner who has a similar idea of doing it, but he is approaching every project as a product, which means that he's looking at it from how can we create as much value to the user as soon as possible. And I'd like to slightly adapt that. What if we could just build one product one time and then distribute that to as many users as possible and then make it as low touch as possible? So then you can truly offer more salty nachos and sell more drinks on the back end, right? So, we started looking at other successful business models outside of WordPress. And so we returned again to Shopify. Again, we didn't wanna do Shopify, we wanted to be in WordPress. But we did wanna take the scalability of Shopify and then turn ourselves, or rather our users into Shopify, but using WordPress instead. Pretty soon we found out that three guys building a cloud platform is a little understaffed, so we we're fortunate enough to get Dexter on board. He's wearing black in this photo, uh, who's also a very old friend of ours. I've known these guys for 20 years, so I can truly say I have a company with my best friends. And we started building it. Now, there may be some of you in the audience who are thinking, hold on, I know how this works. I can also do this with a WordPress multi-site, right? Because I can just build a product and then spin up new subsites, and I can even automate that with some tools. And that yeah, sure, it works for a while, fair, fair enough. Um, but at some point, it is going to have some sort of scalability conflict, right? You, if you're familiar with WordPress multi-site, you know that all the subsites are in the same WordPress installation. And within the WordPress installation, they share the same database and the same file system. They're also on the same server. So as your file system becomes more complicated and you're basically sharing all the user data in the same database, and your scalability is very difficult because you have one customer who becomes really popular and it basically breaks the scalability of all the other subsites on the same server. That results in security concerns and technical issues, which is not what we wanted. And to be, be clear, I'm not a hater. <laughs> I love multi-site. Maybe not for the WAS model then. So instead we did something else. We started looking at Kubernetes which is the dominant and scalable cloud infrastructure of SaaS companies. And with it, we were able to build a containerized platform. 
And this containerized platform introduced something called multi-tenancy. And with that, we were able to combine multi-tenancy with WordPress. So now you've got the scalable infrastructure of SaaS companies, but you're using it to scale WordPress instead. So how does that work? So we were able to identify three scaling challenges that WordPress has if you're using it for a website as a service. First of all, operational scalability. We want to be able to do exactly what SaaS companies are doing, which means we want to unify the development. Like I said earlier, we were building a single product and we're distributing that product and then we want to continuously update and upgrade that product as we go. And for that, we need individual WordPress installations that are still unified in development. So the way we do that is we combine the code, so the plugins, the language files, and the theme files, but we keep the databases separate. That means that after we spin up a site, whatever the customer is doing in the site remains there, but we have control over the code base that's predictable, that's something that we can organize, and therefore we have security, we have scalability. All right, cool. So we've tackled how we build and maintain our product. So now we want to sell it. We want to sell it fast. How do we do it? We automate it. So we build a storefront, and the storefront connects to an API. With the API, you can sell your sites automatically. Yeah, it's just a WooCommerce store. You're selling products. These products, however, are websites. These websites are loaded with content, with plugins, with themes that you as an agency owner have configured because you know your audience. You know exactly the type of service that you are giving that has been working for you in the past. All you need now is a scalable way to build your agency. So cool, we have an API. We can sell websites automatically. Maybe we use it also to update our CRM. Everything works. Finally, we do not want to mess around with servers. Maybe you, Bijnand, not me. Also, I hardly know what they are. Um, and I'm pretty sure there are plenty of agency owners here, maybe except for Jimmy, who also really have no idea how they work or how they scale. So we're doing a containerized platform that results in serverless scaling, so that I don't have to worry about that anymore. Cool. So if you transition from an agency, a project-based agency, to a product-based agency, and you're Dutch like me, so you're focused on recurring revenue, then you suddenly find yourself in the startup space, and you can actually go the VC route. And I was talking to a lot of other agency owners and product companies in the beginning of this week, and one of the things that we can all agree on is that WordPress, historically, has not prioritized business models. After all, we're still selling yearly licenses. And then a company like NitroPack comes along and they start charging monthly and everybody gets upset. But we are actually providing the value. We are actually improving the product. Why not be compensated for that? And then we can thrive together. So then the question becomes, are we wazzing or are we sassing? Sorry. All right, cool. So in our case, uh, we wanted to be um, neutral in the beginning. We didn't want to join with a particular investor that made it hard for us to partner up with other companies after. So we went for Axel Springer, which is a very big media company in Germany, and another company that you might have heard of. And, um, and after a while, Emilia Capital, which is uh, by the founders of Yoast. And we were able to, um, and by the way, I'm not plugging Yoast, even though they have a booth here at Emilia, and you can actually pitch your startup there, and they'll say yes on the spot. So if you have a startup idea or you want to build a product within WordPress and you're looking for funding, please go over there, and you might find yourself with a new investor. Um, but you can implement SaaS methodology for WordPress and then start building products. And you can SaaSify your WordPress portfolio, or you can build an actual SaaS with WordPress. And that enables a predictable recurring revenue, and then we can all go to Thailand. So one of the case studies that I'm personally very proud of, and I also have a booth here at uh, WordCamp Athens, or Europe rather, is Oliver. So what Oliver has done is they've built a POS that is very much integrated with WooCommerce. And based on that, they've built what they call a commerce development kit. So they've built a total solution 
with a curated library store of plugins that you can use and upsell to your customers. And the WooCommerce store seamlessly integrates with um, uh, WooCommerce, or with, rather with the POS, and they've built out so many different products that are completely SaaSified. So they manage the infrastructure, they manage the products, and all you have to do is build the perfect site for your customers, whether that is in retail, or if you're doing it for restaurants or whatever, whatever you need, they got it for you. And it just happens to be hosted on our platform. So what is the big takeaway here? Why do I think that WordPress agencies should adopt a product-based mindset? If we can offer a standardized and accessible product, it doesn't mean that we should do away with projects. Like I said in the beginning, I love projects. I love looking at it from all angles. But if you can sell sites that are standardized and they're completely ready, they're solutions, you can give that to your customers straight away. And you don't have to onboard them, they'll onboard themselves. And then you can create sustainable MRR because they've got something that they can start using. It's fair priced, much lower than when you're selling a big project. It's almost in the range of maintenance, but a little bit more. And then as they become more successful, you'll upsell the services that they need based on the data that you're getting from how they're using the product, from the interactions that you get with them. But you start with the value first, which is one of the big problems that WordPress currently has. If you look at the churn that hosting companies have, I mean, we're looking at what, 30, 40% in the first month? That's because it just takes too long before there's value in your WordPress installation. And as I said earlier, that counts for people still starting out, but also the experienced developer. So then, we find ourselves back in the WordPress community. And this is where all of you get involved. And by the way, it was just said that I was going to launch a live product, and I don't know how many of you are here to see me crash and burn, um, but I'm not allowed to. So uh, after this presentation, I'm going to go over to the Inside WP booth, and if you want to see me crash and burn there, feel free to do so. So okay, so what do I mean with a product-based mindset for the WordPress community? So what's so cool about WordPress, obviously, and I'm not trying to sell you this because you are already here, is that we have this ecosystem of companies that are doing what they do best. And then agency owners, such as the few people in this room, can actually combine that, can implement that for their customer that they have been serving for so long, that they know how to build value for. And then what you, can, you don't have to do all of it, but you can take what you need and then turn it into a product. And so it, it, it lends itself as a perfect vehicle for a thriving ecosystem if you can deliver the value up front, if you can stack it with whatever they need to solve the problem right now, and they have less churn, more activation, and you have so much less work because you're just developing one product, right? And we all focus on what we do most or love most and do best. And so therefore, finally, we, the WordPress community, can do better than Shopify by focusing on our customer, which is a niche, right? On this one single audience that we have been serving for so long and that we love so much, instead of building this very big thing or doing this one single big project, but doing this one big product and serving a lot of people at the same time. So in light of that collaboration, I want to finish this uh, presentation with a bit of an overview of a way that you could do that. So you, I, I've mentioned Vikas before, our wise elephant in the room, or maybe not in this room, hopefully. And what they do is they launch short-lived websites, right? Which, are, which lend itself really well if you want to launch a demo. Right now, they're launching an integration with our platform that allows you to turn InstaWP into a storefront. So you build a site with InstaWP, you save it as a template, you create a storefront on their platform, and you spin it up on a platform such as WPCS. And then you can manage and maintain all your sites as one. Again, I'm not allowed to show you that live, but I think I've made my point. And I hope that recurring revenue could be something that is within our grasp if we take the right approach, which I hope you'll agree with me is product-based. That's it. Thank you, everyone. Um, and 
Thank you, Roger. Now we have um, 15 minutes. So they're about to, for Roger to answer your questions. Um, if you have any questions, can I see your hands, please? One. Okay. Hi. Uh, really interesting project. Um, the mandatory question, what about GDPR? Yeah, what about GDPR? Um, <laughs> like for all different websites, you have like different builds. Like uh, usually, or maybe it's solved for, uh, through like your method, but usually like with each project, there's different requirements to put everything together, data privacy, imprint and all of that. And like, what's your solution for that to cater to the different needs? Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Uh, what's your name, by the way? Oli or Oliver. Right, cool. Oliver, Oli. Um, all right, so let me answer this question by talking about our platform as little as possible, right? Uh, which is kind of the beef that I have with multi sites, because what you're saying is what if we accidentally or maybe a little bit on purpose share user data, right? Which is definitely not what we want. So let's just say you're building websites or you're building a product and you can automatically provision those. So you, you have the foundations of a, a website as a service. Um, well, one of the th things that we definitely need to get in order is that those sites need to be separate. So, well, fortunately we have built, well, I was, wasn't gonna mention our platform, but we've built a way to actually spin up individual sites. So they scale independently, but they're also shared. Uh, we're actually rather they're not shared, they're individual, they're isolated. Um, but yeah, like you say, you want to do that on, in a data center in the region where you're serving it instead of in some shady country where you don't know what they're doing with your... Are you from Germany, by the way? Yeah, Great, <laughs> great country for GDPR. <laughs> you should all host your sites in Germany. Uh, you're <laughs> not allowed GDPR. to do anything. Yeah, I know, it's great. Uh, and, then, and then second of all, you need to have individual sites so that they don't interfere with each other. But yeah, no, it's a great question. It's very important. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you very much. Okay. Next person, please. Hi. Um, yeah, thank you for sharing. It's really interesting. Um, so what you're saying is like as, as they first come on, they onboard themselves. Like I'm guessing it's going to be a simple type of site, like a basic type of grocer type of site. How do you handle it when they either outgrow that? Like do they just come straight off the platform or is there like a middle bit where you can maybe they can add some snippets into it? Obviously, you can solve that later on. But is there like what, how does that look if you actually do allow them to grow? Yeah, got it. No, no, keep the mic for now. Are you an agency owner? Yeah. All right, awesome. So I'll look at it from your perspective, right? So you've got your, oh, maybe you don't, but um, uh, let's just assume you've got your framework for building websites. And so in this particular case, we're automating and we're standardizing that framework. So what I'm saying in this particular model is you're using it as your most accessible product offering. So you have a product that you can deliver to your customers straight away, they onboard themselves, and you're standardizing that. So you're unifying the development and the maintenance, and at some point, that portfolio might have a few outliers. So it could be that they are so popular that they're basically just, they require so much effort from your site, or they just demand so many different resources. And at some point, they develop themselves into a project. So the idea is not to just forego any form of project, but to use it as a platform from which your customers turn into projects and then become more dedicated, more bespoke. So yeah, to, to basically summarize your question, yes, you would offer them a product that is easily onboarded to, you know, easy enough to get started with, sometimes by themselves, sometimes with a little bit of handholding, and then at some point they might turn into your, you know, more, your bigger customer, as it were. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. Thanks. What's your name, by the way? Uh, Josh. Josh. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions, please? Okay. Please. The mic. You can shout. <laughs> um, so you compared um, this with Shopify, for example. Yes. What do you, where do you see the parallels in terms of the pros that Shopify do really, really well to, to be able to um, make this you know, sustainable as a business? And where does Shopify fall down compared to the model that you're trying to incorporate? And do you see it as you know, lots of agency owners trying to do mini versions of <laughs> you, you're, you're, you're asking me to compare WordPress with Shopify, and now, you know, I'm I'm supposed to sell you WordPress <laughs> at WordCamp. Um, so let, let me maybe phrase it a little bit differently, or or put it in a different angle. 
I think what we can learn from Shopify is that it's an all-encompassing solution, right? So one of the few things that, oh, one, of the, one of the things that I really admire, or rather respect about Shopify, is you get one bill. So I was talking to uh, Yoast from Yoast yesterday, um, and uh, uh, they have a Shopify app, and it shows, it doesn't show up on your bill. You just get one bill from Shopify. So you'll pay it for sure, because otherwise your site goes down. And it's, a, it's an e-commerce site, so you're not going to not pay it. So that's great. You know, it's, it's a solution. It's, it's all encompassing. I'm not saying that there should, well, I'm not also not saying, but I'm not saying, just to make that a little bit more complicated, um, that we should have an app store with some form of control or oversight from some form of entity that kind of just goes against the open source nature and the distributed you know, way that we do things. But what I am saying is that we can work together more by adopting that mindset. And then this WordCamp becomes more about, hey, how can we partner up and build a product for the end user and not so much about abiding by some form of rules. Thanks. All right, please, someone at the back, please. Ah, there. Hi there, my name is Henning. Um, a really good presentation, thank you so much. Uh, one question uh, that I didn't quite qu catch. Um, uh, you have a product for onboarding a lot, lots of new clients uh, on a daily basis, I'm assuming. How do you handle uh, when those become projects? Are they still on the same platform or do you kind of move them to a new environment where you can do more customization and kind of adapt to their needs? Right, cool, thanks. Um, uh, yeah, that's... One of my favorite questions, um, because it's, it, it, it's, the, it's the question about vendor lock-in, right? Yeah, not only, but um, um, kind of the flexibility that you need to add to the clients that have particular needs. Yeah. So I don't think there's a company that can be the end-all, be-all of anything. And so the way that we've approached it is, I hope, in true WordPress manner, um, by touching WordPress core as less as possible. Actually, we don't touch WordPress core at all. So in our case, if you take out a site, it's just a site. You can use it anywhere else. And so the way that we see it is we offer a way to productize WordPress, but at some point in time, if your customer is successful, they'll leave, our platform at least. Okay. It always should remain your customer if you're doing a good job. Okay, so your target audience is agencies primarily, our kind of uh, resellers? Uh, well, if our audience was primarily agencies, then I, some of these people in the room wouldn't have much use for me. Uh, but fortunately, no. A lot of plugging companies are using our platform to turn their uh, business into a SaaS. So for example, if you have a plugins like an LMS or a WooCommerce store, or you make marketplaces, this is perfect because you can just SaaSify it straight away. If that's you, by the way, let's talk after. I'm happy to show that. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. All right. Any more questions, please? Good, because I'm okay. parched. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we still have some time. So one quick question for you. What are the typical, like, most common use cases you see for um, WordPress as a service? Yeah, I, I mean, it, it's maybe a bit obvious because I've mentioned Shopify so much, uh, but it's mostly uh, WooCommerce uh, optimized okay. websites. So say, for example, you want to build a Shopify alternative. We have many customers who have started to lose uh, customers to Shopify. And so what they do instead is they build a Shopify alternative, but using WooCommerce instead or something else like NorthCommerce, for example. I mean, it's, it's important to have some form of balance in the ecosystem. And they optimize it completely, so that's just you know ready to go, um, and that's something that they they offer. That's the number one use case I see. The second one, obviously, is portfolio sites because it's usually the most accessible thing that people need. It's the first thing you think about. Mm -hmm. uh, but the thing I like them a lot lately is uh, LMS, so learning management tools, um, especially during the pandemic. Everybody suddenly became a coach and a mentor and a consultant. <laughs> Um, so obviously we have a lot of wisdom to impart on our fellow neighbor. Uh, so yeah, no, if you wanted to build a SaaS that, you know, makes it easy to sell that set wisdom, uh, that's something that you, that we often see as well. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. So you, you would say that there are other niches that, um, 
still, that, that are not explored yet that people can still you know, build solutions for? For sure. Uh, we, we, so when we built the platform, we knew for sure that there were going to be use cases that we hadn't even thought of before. So for example, a, a, a ready-to-go podcasting service. It, I'd never expected that. Uh, many people were suddenly in the link in bio industry or uh, we have people building sites for what they're called again, dark kitchens. Um, you can say we have sites for municipalities that do something with ticketing. It's, I don't know, we, I don't get in, into all of it. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's very wide. It's very, very broad. Uh, anything you want to do or you can productize if you have a particular customer or a cousin that you know really well uh, and you think I can build a site for him, I might as well build a site for all of my cousins, then you can definitely productize that as well. Oh, great. Thank you very much. Um, Thanks. Thank you for, 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 we are grateful for having you here with us. And a round of applause for him, please. I want to hear a round of applause, please. Thank you very much.